SJC 13312, Commonwealth v. Timothy Duguay. All right. Attorney Mark Crane, you're ready. Good morning, Good Chief morning. Justice Budd. May it please the court, Michael Nam Crane for Mr. Duguay. I'd first like to direct, uh, uh, address the uh, state of the blood evidence at trial in 1997. In over two pages of argument, the Commonwealth sold to the jury the significance of orthotology and testing. And this is, I refer the court to volume seven, pages 46 through 40, 48. At least 12 times, the Commonwealth said that the orthotology and testing was positive. In summation, the Commonwealth argued and that orthodontic test, with everything else, is very important to this case, and it tells you what happened in this case, and that's page 48 of the same volume. Well, counsel, though, don't you think your client told everybody what happened when he spoke to um, the police, when he spoke to the neighbor, when he made the threat the day before to his, his I forget who it was, when he said he was gonna kill this, this person? I mean, he, he basically told everybody what was happening. I, I disagree, Your Honor. Well, I think we have to think about is the effect of, of forensic evidence um, on a juror's consideration of the, of the other evidence. The amicus talks about this idea of cognitive bias that's created by forensic evidence, where the jury will then look at the rest, rest of the evidence in the context of, 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 that, of that forensic evidence and, and be, have a confirmation bias about it. So. This was a case, other, otherwise a circumstantial case, where his, Duguay, you know, he made statements about wanting to kill Madeira, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I want you to just think about the fact that the jury was given um, a set of verdict options, five, five verdict options, and two of those had to deal with murder one. One of them was extreme atrocity and cruelty, one of them was premeditation. Now, premeditation is the one where it's about the plan, right? And the circumstantial evidence, a lot of it was supposedly Madeira's, I mean, uh, Mr. DeGay's plan to kill the victim. The jury rejected that. They, they could have found both premeditation and extreme atrocity, extreme atrocity and cruelty, but they rejected the premeditation. They rejected the fact that he had a plan. They also, re the judge also rejected- why, I, I'm, I'm struggling to see why the significance of that, because that would have been consistent, at least in, in terms of the facts that were, presented, right? That, that it wasn't planned out, considering the, the things that happened in the hours and the days. It seemed like it was a fluid thing, and including the, 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 the phone call to uh, his mother a few minutes uh, allegedly before, uh, before the murder. Well, no, that's a good point. I mean, the phone call was really about him, and, and, and that's, a, that's a great point. The phone call is important for many reasons. Number one, the phone call t tells us that his, his intention really was that he wanted to reveal the fact that he was having sex with, with this younger person. And so um, he revealed that, and he felt guilty about that behavior, and that's when, when he was arrested, you know, he said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, if I, if I told you, I would go to jail for life. He's not talking about murder, he's talking about statutory rape, okay? And, and he makes that phone call at 7.36, it's a two minute phone call, that so ends at 7.38. And before that, we know, from the evidence that Madeira tells two of his friends that at 7.30, he's with somebody, or a little bit after 7.30, he's with somebody. That's not Gay because Gay is at home at 7.36 making a phone call. So, so is, he, is he at Madeira's house, goes home, makes a phone call, comes back out, and is there at eight o'clock walking around for lab to see? But all this, this whole, that, that phone call brings out just how impossible it is for Mr. Gay to be the murderer. And I, I wasn't bringing it up for that point, but if I could go back to the blood evidence, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, uh, sure. So the, the things that you pointed to in the record, uh, none of that was not true for the Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth argued the screen results. Uh, they made the argument based on what was in evidence. And I, I mentioned that because uh, isn't there a counter now screen that the defense would like to rely on and say it's not positive for screening of, of blood evidence, right? Well, we have two. We have the, the, the phenophilene, which is sure. a screening test that says everything that they tested is not, no blood on it. But we also have the DNA testing, just like you have in cows and Sullivan, 
where they said there was blood. You know, decades later, they rescreen it for, for with DNA testing, and there's not only no blood because there was pre-screening in those cases, at least in Sullivan, but there's no DNA. And in fact, the the victim is excluded from several areas where there was supposed to have been his DNA on it. So wouldn't you be doing the same thing? Wouldn't you be arguing the, 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 the other inference uh, from, your, from your screening evidence that you're saying the Commonwealth is wrong to have done in, in the trial? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be jumping up and down saying we did a screening well, test and there's, there's no blood, there's no blood? Wouldn't you be doing that? Well, no. Well, I mean, how would it play out? I guess, you know, as you know from the case law, we need to look at how this would play out now. It was retried today. Sure. And today, none of that, none of, those, none of that blood would come in at all. None of those clothing, they'd all be excluded because they're irrelevant. They got, there's no blood and there's no DNA. So it would be the case, that circumstantial what case, would, would less, no... What, what evidence would remain if you excluded that? There would be... And it's important to think about, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, Kevin Reddington was a trial attorney below, eminently experienced. He's trying to deal with his blood evidence. And, he, you know, and he's, he's battling uphill because he's, got, he's battling against his orthotology. But it would be much, think about how much easier it would have been to argue this case if all he was talking about was all that circumstantial evidence. He, would, he, he, had, he had explanations. Why don't you tell me what that circumstantial evidence is? So... We can, we can assess how easy it might be to argue or not. Well, his statements about wanting to, to kill Madeira, if you look at Kevin's, Kevin Reddington, Mr. Reddington's argument, he talks about how that's really, you know, sort of ridiculous because, you know, he had no real intention to kill okay, her. Okay, so, but, so that's one thing. That's right? one thing, right. What's the second thing? The confession to his mother, that's about illicit sex, not murder, okay? To is, why, but why isn't that advocate's gloss? I mean, it doesn't. I mean, that's the that's in the light most favorable to the defendant, but but the jury doesn't have to buy that. Well, the jury can doesn't buy anything. It can, right, but right. I'm saying, but you're 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 presenting it like how much easier would it be without the blood evidence right. to argue this circumstantial case for an acquittal? It's exactly. not that easy at all, actually, because if they if they don't buy the argument that, uh, again, looking at this in the light most favorable to the defendant that. You know all of these different things in the the things in the days and the hours, uh, four days before the issue with the default with, with the judgment, and and saying I'd rather not have you pay it, I'd rather you stay with me, not doing that uh, two days before the murder, the calls I want to kill him. Why why would the jury have to look at it the way that you're saying to conclude that it would be a much easier plight for the defendant? Well, I I I, I would. I'd ask your honor not to look at it as what, is what the jury would think, because we don't want to, we're not, we're trying, we're not, we shouldn't be reweighing the evidence here and now for the jury. What this court is tasked with doing is where subsequently discredited evidence likely did function as a real factor, that is the orthotology evidence, the court may not then assess whether the jury would still have reached the same conclusion. The, ev the blood evidence is, is certainly a real, was a real factor to the jury. Because, and we know that because, and we have to, we assume that, number one, because of how the Commonwealth presented. The Commonwealth knew its case. It knew its case, one of the pieces of the puzzle. And it presented its case as a puzzle. It said, put, but it all together, and I'm looking at, this is volume seven, page 29, but it all together. Think of it as a puzzle all together. When you put it all together, the Commonwealth is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And one of the explicit pieces of that puzzle and I'm looking at volume 751, lines 8 through 9, is the orthotality and testing. Which so they're presenting the case as a puzzle. They, it, they are, but I'm yeah. looking at this in the lens of whether or not uh, Judge Sullivan abused his discretion. And in, in, in saying that, there wasn't any confirmatory evidence at trial, and the, and the Commonwealth never argued that. And that's what we specifically said the first time this came on appeal. And, and uh, uh, Attorney Reddington did everything that he could to say it, it's, there's no evidence that it's the defendant's blood. So it wasn't as if the, 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 the jury was misled by this, that somehow this blood came from Mr. Duguay. Now, if you, if you now then come forward to the motion for new trial, you, you argue and say, I now have evidence of another screening test that shows it's negative for blood. And so now, at best, 
the, I, the, the, the question is whether or not Judge Sullivan abused his discretion in saying that wouldn't have been a real factor because both would have gone to the jury and the jury was able to freely make a decision one way or the other. Explain that part for me. Well, I disagree with your premise, Your Honor. Justice Sullivan definitely abused his discretion because he's looked at the wrong standard of review. His standard, his standard of analysis was plainly rejected by this court in Cowles at 623, where, and I just had set, quoted it, where we have evidence that is subsequently discredited um, and as likely was a real factor, you may not then assess whether the jury would still have reached the same conclusion. You're, at, you're basically premising. But Cowles wasn't the same case. Wasn't Cowles, there was confirmatory testing done on that towel? I. I know it was done in Sullivan. I can't tell if it's. I well, tell Ka Ka Cowles was the was the bloody towel case. Right? Exactly right. Right, but it was there was confirmatory testing done in that that definitively said one way or the other that it did not come from the defendant or the victim, right? Right, but he still it was still. But no, no, again, no, again, no, no, that's, no, no. that's a non-exclusion. But that's, that's, a, a, that's a big difference from here. Well, there's uh, no there's no confirmatory testing. I, I disagree, done here. Your Honor, because that's a non-exclusion, and you have in cases I believe. Um, in the Cameron case, when you have non-exclusion, that the jury is perfectly able to take that as an inclusion. They can credit that as, as, as being blood, or whatever it is that you know, the, the Commonwealth wants it to believe. Mm -hmm. And the Commonwealth desperately wanted them to believe that this was blood in this case. And, 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 and you know, they, they sold Bunnell as this reliable witness. They said, well, she's just doing her job. I'm looking at uh, uh, volume seven, page 46, lines 11 through 17. She's just doing her job. She's just given, you know, the evidence, you know, like she's just this neutral party. But on her to redirect, you know, she's defending what she did. She's saying, I do this test daily. I've done it thousands and thousands of times. And this is remarkable. She says, I can tell false positive tests from, you know, from negative, by just by looking at it. I mean, why, would, why do we even have confirmatory testing if this person can tell just by looking at it a false positive? I think, can I, I ask? Think what we're, go ahead, please. Um, can I ask you to go back to Justice Cipher's question, because I think it's important for at least me to hear what your answer is. What other evidence was there? You started saying uh, the statement that he wanted to kill the victim, the confession to the victim's mother. What other evidence was there if we exclude uh, the blood evidence? Well, I mean, if, you're, if you're asking what other <coughs> circumstantial evidence there was. Yes. 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 Yeah, so there's you know, the statement to his mother, that he's, ha that she's, he's having. Yeah, so I have that. So right. there's a statement his, to his mom, his, he wants to kill the victim. What else his, is there? His, his statements to, the, to, to people that he wants to kill, he's angry at the victim, you know, he wants to kill him in this hyperbolic way. He tells the police he's going to go to jail for the rest of his life. Right, because he, he tells them what happened. Exactly, because he committed statutory rape for five years. Yeah, but that's not a life felony. Well, it, actually, under 265.22 and 22A, in some theories, it is life. You okay, so there's that? a statement of life, and then what else is there? And then there is the fact that he lives next door. You know, he lives a thousand feet away. You know, the crow flies from the victim's house, and uh, and you know, the, and this idea that you know. Isn't there uh, some kind of identification to there? There's see somebody leaving, right? The EMT. Well, yeah. Right. So there's uh, an, an ambulance driver, Miss Ladd. She says at eight o'clock she sees a person with dark clothing, clothing walking down the street. Ignoring the screams, um, and this court, you know, this court in its, in its original decision notes, and he's found with, dark and he's fired with dark clothes, mm -hmm. and that's and how and so that blood colors that whole scenario, it, it smears the whole scenario in a, in a, in a lens of blood because You're saying that was all the circumstantial evidence there was. That's the circum well, that's the circumstantial evidence, yes. There's and nothing else. Well, uh, what about the denials to the police about the relationship until they come back and say? Hey, we f we listened to this voicemail. Well, I, I I know that I understand what you're saying, Your Honor. But though, when presented with that t sort of evidence, the judge rejected a consciousness of guilt instruction. So I didn't. He, didn't, he the trial attorney, trial judge, didn't give that much weight. But yes, there are there are items like that mm -hmm. that are that that exist. There are parts of this puzzle, right? But the Commonwealth sells that puzzle with the orthotology, and it says that all together, this is our case. Not separate, all together. And if you believe this all together, then you have to convict them. But, th but that's a closing argument in the Commonwealth case. 
That's a closing argument. And, and, and not just this case. That's what you do in a closing argument for the Commonwealth. Right. We're trying to, hold on. Yeah, sure. So what we're trying to figure out is whether or not this would have been a real factor. Um, that, that's really what we're getting at from Cowles, whether right. it would have been a real factor. And the point of all these questions is when you marshal all the other evidence, would this be a real factor if you had questions about the blood that the jury didn't know about? It, it definitely would be a real factor. Again, as this court has noted, and I think as you have noted, Your Honor, in other oral arguments, the, the jurors are looking for corroboration. So we have a set of, of circumstantial evidence, right, that Mr. Reddington explains away one way or the other. Then so the jury is looking for corroboration. Is this, did it really happen? And that's the orthotolidine. The orthotolidine makes it, that's the corroboration. They are able to believe that he was in the black bloody room with the victim killing him because of the blood. That's the corroboration. That's, uh, you know, and, and, and Amicus explains how, like, the juries are looking for that. They're looking to give decisive weight to that kind of evidence. And so that's, that's why it's a real factor. It's the, it's the essential piece of the puzzle that brings everything else together. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> okay, Attorney Hanson. Thank you. Good morning, Arne Hansen for the Commonwealth. This is not a case that was predicated, the conviction was not predicated on forensic evidence, it was predicated on circumstantial evidence. But, you know, you say that, but then in closing argument, the prosecutor seemed to make much of the um, blood evidence. Yes, I understand that. Um, the propriety, proprietariness of her closing argument was previously evaluated by this court, which stated that there were reasonable Well, it's not that it's improper. It's just that the prosecutor did make much of the blood evidence, as, as uh, your opposing counsel is saying. It's tying all the pieces together. I'm wondering what your response is. With respect to the actual state of the evidence, yes, the prosecutor made um, references in closing to but the presumptive But weren't those important test. references, or, or how were they not important? Let me know that. With respect to the evidence in its entirety. It's an unusual case where it's a stabbing with 21 stab wounds, there's blood all over the crime scene, there's no fingerprints anywhere. There's no DNA recovered from the knife other than the victim's DNA. Right, so it so sounds you like you're making the argument for your evidence. opposing counsel that in fact this evidence of blood on the jacket and the jeans and the sneakers was important because otherwise there's no physical evidence tying the defendant to the scene. Is that what you're saying? That, yes. Okay. With so respect how, how, how doesn't that meet the, the standard for a new trial? With respect to the remainder of the physical evidence as well as the purported newly available evidence which really doesn't change the landscape for what was presented but, at but trial. That's where I have some problems. I have the same concerns that Justice Wendland has because it's such a bloody crime and <laughs> we've got no blood without this, you know. It, it just it, it it just sort of changes the whole case in certain ways, doesn't it? I don't believe so. <laughs> I mean your your brief I get it. There's a lot it's hard to imagine someone else did this. I get it. He's angry at him. He's threatening him that day. Um, uh, the statement about I'm going to do life sounds more like murder than rape. Um, but at the same time, you've got this bloody crime, incredibly bloody crime. The first trial is all that is resolved with this. He's covered in blood, uh, you know, through the and now all that goes away. So it's like, it seems like it's a different case the second time around. I would, stay, I would say that the evidence hasn't changed because on cross-examination. Of, of course it has, because the jury is comforted in the first time with all the blood, isn't it? Because the blood, someone's stabbed 21 times, there's no fingerprints, there's no blood, but this, whatever this test is, is suggested to be blood. Um, so the jury doesn't have that confusion anymore. Now, all that goes away. So when all that goes away, is it likely a real factor? That's the question we have to ask, right? I would say that the state of the evidence hasn't changed since trial because the chemist on cross-examination with Attorney Reddington admitted that there was no blood found. I, I thought, is that what she admitted or? It, it was that, that is correct. So she stated that it was a presumptive test only 
and that it tested positive for vegetation and any number of other substances. And Attorney Reddington, and I quote it in and what is the, my brief. What, what does the Commonwealth's closing say about that? What's the closing? The closing doesn't do that. Closing, closing doesn't say that. It says the opposite, right? That it's blood, right? I mean, I, that, that, that is a fair assessment. That's, and, uh, that's the, a fair interpretation of the closing argument, yes. Okay, so, because it's a possibility that it's all blood. And what about the, the comment about false positives that your brother brought up? Was that, what's your comment about that? That was again raised before the jury, that it's a presumptive test that raises, uh, that raises false positives with what, her. What, what do you mean by, what does that mean, a presumptive test? Does, did it mean it, it's presumed to be blood? Is that what the statement It's suggests? It's a first step analysis right. where you, you swab the hands and it comes up as potentially blood, but without further analysis, there's no way of actually determining whether or not it's blood or vegetation right. or but presumptive food. is a misnomer in that context. Mm. Yes. What um, can you talk about the hair on the knife? Yes. Yeah, so initially, the hair on the knife was tested. Or at trial, the evidence for the hair on the knife was that it was compared by the chemist. She stated that it was dissimilar to the defendants and the victims, and that's what the jury had in front of them, that the hair belonged to someone that wasn't the victim or the defendant. Defendant then had the hair tested several times during the process for this motion for new trial. The first time, they used one DNA test that compared it to the defendant's DNA sample as well as the victim's reported uncle, the uh, Robert Gomes. And that test came back to matching neither of them. Then the hair was retested this past fall. Um, as I stated in my motion to expand the record, in July we paused proceedings here so that the test could come back, uh, that test could come back. And then I received a report on January 20th stating that the hair on the knife belonged to the victim. And that was the information that I received and directly from- And the knife is found where? At the murder scene. So it's not found at the defendant's house, it's found at the murder scene. Correct. What, what does that add to, it shows that the knife is the murder weapon, but it doesn't show who did it, right? Correct, the defendant claimed that because initially, as he presumed that the knife or the hair on the knife didn't belong to either the defendant or the victim, that it must have been a third, an unknown third party culprit. The most recent tests completely dissolve that claim where the only thing that's found can, on the knife is the- you back, because I'm, what, what, what bothers me is, okay, so he lives very close. Correct. They come to his house within like 25 minutes of the murder, right? I believe the victim was found around 7.50 and at 8.20 they arrived at the defendant's house. Okay, so they arrived that quickly, but again, there's no blood anywhere. Um, they get a search warrant for his house right away too? I can't remember. Um, I'm not sure what the timeline was, but yes, they did search the house and they don't find any blood in his house. So again, help me, because your brief doesn't help me, and I want you to help me. So help, help me explain, again, the, the blood is provided in the first trial in this kind of cute way. I'm not saying it was, it's done properly at the time, but now that is undermined. And how does the jury, how does that not make a difference given there's no blood at his house. There's no blood in these clothes. Um, I, tell me how that just doesn't matter, because that's where I'm having trouble. And your brief doesn't help me, because it just tells me about all the other circumstantial evidence. But I'm just, May I interject yeah, something on the back yeah. end of Justice Kafka's point? I thought there was an uh, orthotolidine testing in the house that did, that did come back positive in some places. Uh, sink, light switch, am I, am I wrong about that? That, that does sound correct um, from memory, but I'd have to refer back to the, um, to so the is transcripts. There, is there some blood in the house? I mean, it's just because, again, his view is he, he's pleading guilty to <laughs> old child rapes. I, I don't know what he's, that, I don't find that very convincing, but I find the disappearance and absence of blood important unless you can help me out because there's no again 21 stab wounds right person's got to be covered in blood or there's got to be blood somewhere at trial the, the prosecution says 
these clothes indicate there's blood on the clothes, essentially, at closing, right? Correct. Now, in your brief this time, you say, well, he changed his, you suggest he changed his clothes. I understand that's, that's one possibility and that, that is but, speculative. But we don't, they search his house, right? There's no clothes, there's no bloody clothes. He doesn't have time to wash up, right? There's no blood anywhere in the house either. I just, again, help there, me out. There's on the, blood in the victim's house though. Plenty Correct. Blood I get it, there's plenty okay. of blood in the victim's house, but there's nothing, there's no blood, there's no bloody clothing, nothing, right, on, at his house. No. So With again, why is that not likely to matter? And I'm it's, I, I'm, it's not rhetorical. I just want you to help me out why it's not likely to matter. Because the defendant was convicted based on circumstantial evidence, based on his own statements prior to the fact, their longstanding relationship where, you know, he started raping the victim when the victim was 12 years old, that vic and that transpired over the course of five years. That individual became 17 and then st said, I don't want to do this anymore, and started distancing himself from the defendant. Um, is this a situation where um, the, is it Bunnell, B-U-N-N-E-L-L, -L, but her testimony on the ortho uh, blood sampling, would that, would that evidence be excluded, as your opposing counsel says, or would it just um, be served up alongside the new DNA evidence? I believe it would just be served up. It, it doesn't- Why? You know, what is the legal standard? I know you take that position. Your opposing counsel takes the opposite position. But why is this presumptive test, as you called it, even admissible uh, if it's only a screening test and we have uh, definitive DNA saying there is either no blood or it doesn't belong to the defendant? Why would it even come in? So I would- disagree with um, your honor's assessment of I'm not assessing it just tell me the argument again it would be impeachment evidence so the newly discovered but evidence but nobody's saying Bunnell is lying it's just this is what the test shows and it turns out the test is baloney because it's just presumptive right and 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 now we've got more definitive science saying it's not blood that's correct I would also well I would point out one that the phenomenon the Phenolophilinian test. That's why I avoided saying it. <laughs> also a presumptive test. Right. Okay, so, so it it's is two presumptive tests thing. against each other, so they both come in and it'd be sort of like up to the jury to decide right. Correct. which is the better science. Now with respect to the DNA evidence, so the yeah. Bodhi also tested the jacket for DNA and found 24 partial DNA profiles. Out of those 24, they exclude the victim from four of them. Um, that's because the defendant's DNA on the jacket. The other 20 are inconclusive. Now, when it's inconclusive, and as I cite in my brief, um, it's Commonwealth v. Matthews, it's, you can't ex exclude or include anyone. So it's still possible that the victim's blood is on those clothes, but we just can't come to that conclusion. Is it blood on that? Is that DNA from blood, or is it DNA in general? It's inconclusive. From like there. rolling around in the plants, vegetation. <laughs> um, they tested for DNA, so I, I can't say that there was blood know on each the other. And, and, and they were intimate two days earlier, right? I mean, they, is that right? I mean, so it's not, the fact that his DNA is on the guy's coat may not mean anything, right? That's a fair assessment. So given all that, so you're just saying it's, you know, rely on the circumstantial evidence and therefore it doesn't, the blood evidence is kind of, uh, doesn't, uh, is not a, f a substantial factor. Yes, and I would also argue that the state of the blood evidence hasn't changed since the trial. The new DNA tests don't exclude or include the victim from the, the DNA found on the defendant's clothes that he was wearing. The hair found on the knife is shown to be the victim's hair, which makes this argument of an unknown third party culprit less, even less likely because I, there's I no I'm evidence. I'm confused by that. If the knife is found at the house, is it his knife or is it just somebody's knife? Came I on. believe there were kitchen knives from the victim's home. Right, so it, but how does that connect? How does that show us that the defendant is the stabber? It's the victim's hair on the knife, not the defendant's. It's not the defendant's DNA on that knife. It's the victim's knife. I just don't get how that helps. It, 
it only discourages or it only dilutes the defendant's claim that there was another individual that was responsible and that was never followed up. Why couldn't the other individual come in, use the knife, kill him, and run? Well, he could, couldn't he? But the argument at the original trial was that that hair is not belonging to the defendant or the victim, therefore it must be a third person. Correct. Oh, I got you. Mm -hmm. So the real um, issue that, that the defendant is raising, you, you don't have to show necessarily that the verdict would have been different, but whether or not um, this evidence was a substantial factor. And the last point that the appellant made was that there's a certain comfort with the jury when they have a view of the evidence and then they have corroboration. That, that, that's what juries want. They want corroboration. It's a tough job. And proof beyond a reasonable doubt is and should be a, a very high standard. And, it, and, and his point is that if you look at the case and you look at the closing, that the jury being able to go into the jury room and sort of have that comfort that there's also forensic evidence means that it was a real factor in the deliberations. Why isn't that right? Because the chemist was properly examined on cross-examination and essentially testified by the end of her testimony that there was no blood on the, um, on the defendant's clothes. And I'm confused. Is that what she said, or she couldn't conclusively say it's blood versus something else? That's she initially she, she outlined the limits of the test that she did, and that's what she said there, that there is, it could test positive for any number of things. It could be blood. It could be something else. And then the prosecutor at closing says it's blood, um, or it's reasonable to conclude that it's blood, right? Attorney, so, it's, oh, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Attorney Reddington specifically asked her, do you le mean to leave this jury with the conclusion that there was blood on this individual's clothes, and the, she said no. So that was specifically addressed. So the, the evidence at trial, as it was properly explored, was that there was no blood. We're suggesting that there was anything wrong with the way the prosecutor did it at trial. It's just now that we have the benefit of hindsight in this new test, it's different, because it's, we know it's not blood. I, I, the prosecutor couldn't have argued at the time, right, that this is, that closing would have been wrong if we had this DNA test now, right? He couldn't say that. I, yeah. so the test, the t there was a test for DNA, which tests for DNA, and it doesn't test for blood. Um, and then there was a presumptive, the, full, the pheno Lafrian test is also a presumptive test. Mm -hmm. So it's in the exact same state as it was at trial, it's just a different test that was done by the defendant. There was never been any confirmatory tests done on any of the materials found, on any of the clothes found, that states this is not blood. Mm -hmm. okay, again, and it may be my own ignorance. So knowing what we know now from this DNA test about the clothing, is it still possible to argue that there's blood on that clothing and that that blood belongs to the victim? No. We can't do that, correct? Correct. Okay. What about, um, was that evidence newly available? Newly discovered, newly available testing? With respect to the DNA or the other? Uh, uh, with respect to the uh, phenophailing testing. That was available prior to the trial. I think that's the Di Benedetto case, and I cite that in my, um, my brief. 